it's Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebass.com, which is the home of online learning for double bass players with our interviews, our lessons and our courses. And today I'm joined by a new tutor at the website and they are also the principal bass player from the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. They're a faculty member at the University of Queensland and also at the Conservatorium of Music. So it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Phoebe Russell. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure to work with you this week and such a pleasure to be part of the Do Discover Double Bass family. Well, I'm just so pleased that we managed to make it happen. Obviously, with you being in Australia, it was, um, yeah, it was a little bit more complicated than some people we've worked with, but it's just been such a joy to hear you play um, and to hear your lessons and your teaching. But maybe you could start the conversation by letting us know a little bit about yourself. What are you doing at the minute, Phoebe? Yeah, so as you mentioned, the Queensland Symphony Orchestra, I'm doing a lot of teaching at the moment in Queensland. But um, basically, I am trained in Germany, so I studied in Berlin at the Karian okay. Academy of the Berlin Phil, um, and I studied at Hans Eisler in Germany. Um, so a lot of the playing techniques that I'll be sharing are fairly Germanic-based um, playing techniques. Um, but I really enjoy playing solo repertoire, so at the moment I've been taking any opportunity I possibly can to get into a bit of solo playing and playing concertos with orchestra and putting on recitals where I can. That's fantastic. And before we, we move to the story about your time in, in Germany, um, who really got you excited about the double bass in Australia? There must have been somebody that you saw that you were like, I want to sound like that person. Who was it? Okay, so um, the first time I heard the double bass played in a really like soloistic and impressive fashion um, was when I actually, someone bought me, I think my parents bought me the London double bass sound. <laughs> I've got that CD. How good is yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah, so Doesn't it have a Spice Girls song on it? Am it's I... got Wannabe by the yeah, Spice Girls. Yeah, I knew it did, yeah. <laughs> and um, it's got like, uh, for me, it was the Paganini, Moses Variation, Gary Carr playing. I was so impressed because I was kind of, um, I guess playing the bass wasn't my first priority as a kid and it was something that I kind of fell into. So hearing the bass played in that way by Gary Cart just really inspired me at such a young age. And I basically just wanted to be just like him when I was a kid. Oh, we all do. <laughs> and have you ever met Gary? Have you had the chance to play for him at all? Yeah, so I'm actually super fortunate that when I was 15, I got a chance to go over and study at his car camp, um, oh, wow. which was a course that ran for a really long time. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that it runs anymore. But, um, I'm not sure, actually. Yeah, I think, I think he did the last one a few years ago. But I was really lucky I got to spend a month working with him. Um, wow. We had master classes every day, so I got to have three lessons a week with Gary and it just totally made my life as a bass player. <laughs> Who were some of the other students or maybe some of the other um, members of the faculty at the car camp? Do you remember anyone? Was there anyone that you were studying with or stu learning from? So funnily enough, actually, now that you mentioned that, um, yeah. James Oessie was, oh, was James there Oessie, with me. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah, so we met at that car camp. I was 15 oh. and he was probably about 19 or maybe 20. Um, and it, like he was a great inspiration in itself because I was looking at going overseas to study and um, he'd kind of already studied in so many different places so we talked a lot about that together um and there was han han cho i haven't seen her for years but she is just phenomenal bass player um and then the faculty was really just gary so it was gary yeah. and his partner Harmon lewis who was there to accompany the classes wow that's incredible that you were doing that at 15 so you're going from australia to america to go and uh, so canada um, to, to study with Gary, that's, that's amazing. Well, I mean, I, w I was very lucky to have very supportive parents that were happy to support that. Um, and my mum actually came over with me for the month, um, so I didn't have to do it alone. <laughs> so, OK, you're making your way over to Germany, but at this point you're studying with Gary. Was he the person who introduced German bow to you? When did that become part of your plan, or were you learning German bow a lot earlier in your career? Yeah, so actually I started on French bow like a lot of people do and I think a lot of Australians do. Um, it was just the bow that the school had available and I, I basically switched because I had an injury um, when I was about 12 or 13. Basically, I think I had terrible French bow technique <laughs> and my German, my, my teacher actually happened to play the German bow um, so she told me to switch over and I, I kind of just naturally got rid of that problem. Um, and then when I went to study with Gary, I was already playing German bow, but he taught me how to stand because I was always um, a player that sat to play and he made everyone in the class stand up. Basically, he didn't give you an option, which was very cool because um, I, was, I was terrified to do it. But 
my main reason for sticking with it was that I didn't have to carry a stool as well as a base. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I've noticed uh, when, we, when we were preparing for our sessions this week, I've obviously been watching videos of you perform, and, and I've never seen you play seated. And, I mean, presumably you're doing the orchestra, I would imagine. And, but... Yeah, so when I play an orchestra, I sit. Um, mm. And when I practice repertoire for orchestra, I, I usually sit. But I just feel that I have a lot more freedom when I stand. I feel like yeah. I can move a lot more naturally. And not only that, I also feel that the bass resonates a little bit more freely um, when the back of the instrument's not attached to my body. Okay. So that time with Gary really helped you develop that soloistic voice, because, I mean, James is a wonderful soloist as well. And was there anything else from that time that you can remember learning or being inspired by uh, on the, uh, the camp? Um, so I have a couple of really cool memories from that camp. Basically, I think at two points um, we, went to, we went to Gary's house and he performed for us with Harmon. They've actually got an organ as well as a piano in really? it. Really? It's phenomenal, like a mini concert hall. Oh. Um, and they did a recital which I was just blown away by. I think everyone knows how Gary plays, everyone's seen his recordings. Um, he's fairly unconventional, obviously, but in an absolutely fantastic way. And just seeing him live, like, he's such an emotional player, such an expressive player, not only, like, in the passionate sense, but also in the way that he brings so much joy. Um, he just loves the bass so much. And I, I think I'll, I'll just never forget hearing him play live for the first time. Sure. And, OK, so this is a bit of a story about that. I was so passionate about that concert that um, my mum kind of said, why don't you make a T-shirt of you and Gary? And, like, <laughs> and I, um, I, I basically, for him, you know, as a joke, so I printed out um, the first picture we'd taken together and I put it on a T-shirt and I, like, um, bedazzled it with, like, pink sparkles because it was my favourite colour, still is. Um, and we gave it to him at the end of the course and he thought it was great, like hilarious. And then I actually went back to see him play a few years later. He was playing the recital and then halfway through he just opened up his shirt. Oh, really? <laughs> and he was wearing our shirt with the picture of us on it. It was like very, very cool, he's <laughs> very funny he, moment. He's an incredibly special person. He's a real treasure of the bass world. And um, so the next big thing I would imagine would be your trip to Germany. Is that, the, was that a really key part of your career, of your development, and maybe you could speak a little bit about that. You were quite young, I believe. Yeah, so I decided at a fairly young age that I wanted to be a professional bass player. Um, I actually dropped out of school when I was 15, 16, during grade 11, and I spent a year at the Australian National Academy of Music um, in Melbourne, which is an incredible performance program. Um, basically, we did chamber music and solo performance. Um, and then from there, I did some auditions um, I went over to Germany to audition for Hans Eisler and for the Karian Academy. And I was fortunate enough to get into both. So I decided not to come back home. And I stayed there for five or six years after that. Five or six years? I didn't realise it was that long. Yeah. Wow. And, and maybe you could, who were some of the people that you were studying with at that time? Because it was, you know, there's some huge names of, in the bass world, particularly within the orchestral double bass world, I think. Yeah, so one of the coolest things about the Carry On Academy is that basically you play in the section of the Berlin Philharmonic for a two-year two -year period, and then you get to have lessons with one or two of the teachers there. And I was fortunate enough to have lessons with pretty much everyone in the section, actually, during my time there. Um, even I was very, very fortunate to have lessons with Klaus Stoll, who had already retired at that stage. Um, and we talked about this a little bit together, about the impact that he had on me and how he was um, a really positive impact for my husband, who's a bass player as well, yes. and me. Um, and we used to spend a lot of time talking music with him and, yeah. The uh, time that you spent, I can't imagine at that age, sitting in the Berlin Phil bass section. Like, what was that experience like? Maybe the first time you heard it, and, you know, what, is it, what memories does that bring back? I mean, obviously, it was phenomenal, but also scary. So scary for a few reasons. <laughs> the first one being that, um, so the way that they book in the Berlin Phil is not necessarily a very formal way. So I never got any sort of written confirmation about coming to play. Uh, they, they told me after my Carry On Academy audition, you know, would you like to play with us in two weeks? Um, and then I never really heard anything. So for starters, I thought, what if I've dreamt this? You know, it's kind of hard to believe as an 18-year-old um, that, that, that this is going to happen. So I, I thought, oh, my God, can you imagine if I've just totally dreamt this? So in the weeks leading up to playing there, there was a bit of that. Um, but when I came to rehearsal, I noticed that there was a chair there for me, thankfully. Um, and then the other thing is that that orchestra, they really don't play with the conductor. 
Really? So, I mean, they definitely, the conductor's more of a guide, a musical guide, um, someone that shapes the phrases. But the orchestra in itself play like some sort of organism that just naturally work together. Um, and so that was a little bit, um, I don't know, intimidating. It, it was something that I had to get used to. It was really just trying to ride the wave. So you're, and... you're taking your cue from the principal, I take it? That, I mean, that's what I did because I was just in the section, obviously. So I took all of my cues from the principal and definitely watched the other principals around the orchestra. But they had this incredible way of just totally taking control of every phrase, every connection between phrases and... Um, and really just making music in a very uncontrolled, untame way. Yeah, that sounds absolutely in incredible. Who, who were the principal players at the time? I presume there was more than one or... In the bass section? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we had Yane Saksala. Oh, fantastic. Um, who uh, is an amazing teacher that I personally loved learning from. Yeah. And then Matt McDonald, and then Esko Liner. So two Finnish and Australian. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And they were welcoming in young players as well because it's such an incredible orchestra. It's one of the world's finest and they have this, in, this bass section that, you know, of all these, these huge names. Maybe you could speak a little bit about what you learned from... Uh, sorry, I'm bad with the pronunciation of his name, Jana. Um, how do you pronounce that? I'm sorry. Yanni. Yanni. Sorry, yeah. I, I always feel, feel a little uncomfortable about getting that right. <laughs> but what did you learn from studying with Yanni? What were some of the things that... Did, did he look at your German bow hold and, um, you know, what was some, coming from Australia to Germany? You'd, yeah, you know. so I had quite a few teachers before I moved to Yanni. He was sort of towards the end of my studies um, and my husband Bernardo was studying with him already and I was a little bit envious because, you know, I love, love him as a player. Um, and so when I, when I started learning from Yanni, um, the first thing I think I really wanted to address was my spiccato technique, which is something that I find quite hard on the German bow. Um, and I also find the way that they play spiccato in Germany is fairly unique um, in that you're not just going for a front of the note, you're really going for a full, warm, resonant sound. Um, and it was something that I felt that I'd never really fully grasped the, context, the concept of. So... I spent probably the first few lessons with him working through that. And then from then on, I just, I just found him an incredibly fascinating musician. Um, he, you know, especially, you know, a lot of bass teachers obviously tend to talk a lot about technique, but at the stage that I was out in my studies, I felt we could be a little bit more free to talk about music. Um, and I learned not only about music, but also about um, producing a big sound with him, producing a really cutting resonant sound and, um, yeah, a, a lot. And, and also, there's incredible people with you in the section, and one of them we were chatting yesterday, uh, Edickson Ruiz, I believe, you were playing alongside him. What was... Yeah, how did you find that experience? I mean, he's a, you know, a, a shining light and a, an incredible artist in the bass world for his solo repertoire, but what was it like playing in an orchestra with him? Um, yeah, so obviously he was someone that I was particularly excited to meet. Um, sure. I think I heard about Edickson before I'd heard about the Berlin Philharmonic. Um, because I'd heard about Elsa Stemmer and heard about all the amazing, um, you know, all of his amazing work there. Um, so actually in my first project with the Berlin Phil, when I just turned 18, I was sitting with Edickson um, and I found him incredibly welcoming. Uh, more than anything, he really, he put me at ease because he's just so kind and, and relaxed and very easy to play with because he's got such yeah. a sense of innate musicality. What but is it you love about his playing? I love his legato playing and I love the way that he can develop a phrase, like he develops notes. I feel like he's someone that just created a, his own style of playing at a very early stage in his career. And like if you, if you turn on a recording, you, you pretty much know it's him, right? Yeah. It's a similar thing with Gary Carr. I, I feel, yeah, that, that he's got a very unique way of playing, which was cool for me. And, and we talk a lot about, you know, the uh, German bow hold, uh, but what about the left hand? Was there much stuff happening or many changes that you were, uh, you know, doing? What was that, you know, how did that work in, in that sense? Yeah, so I think in Germany, uh, the first thing that's spoken about is sound production. Um, and you can get away probably with more problems in the left hand than in the right hand. The right hand is definitely the priority. Yeah. Um, and so I really focused on having a good quality of sound and creating a a sound that blends well in a section. Um, but then I went on to study with a teacher called Janusz Witzig, 
um, who made a huge impression on me in my studies. And he was really strict with the technique. Um, he was really inspired by Petrarchi um, and by these traditional schools. Have you ever met Petrarchi? I have actually. Because of Janos, he inspired me. I went to Petrarchi's course. Wow. In Italy, yeah. Is that so, how you play with such wonderful thumb position technique? Is I, that, I think, we always think of him when we think of... I think so, because um, Janos really noticed that I was playing a lot with fairly flat fingers. Um, I got away with that for a long time because I think... Can you show us what you mean by that? Yeah, so, um, so I was kind of playing with, with, my col with fingers that are really collapsed. Um, and, I mean, I don't think it's inherently a bad thing because it meant that I had a really kind of rich sound and rich vibrato, but I felt that I really couldn't... I didn't have the stamina that I wanted to have. Yeah. Um, so Janos really taught me how to play. Like, I basically completely recreated my whole structure of the left hand in fact there wasn't really much of it at all like, when i when i went to him I, I really had to relearn all of this sort of petrarchy um hand positioning and i got petrarchy's book and we worked through all the exercises um and a lot of the exercises that i teach my students that i've written are very similar in terms of concept to what he taught me so what are some of the key things that you want your students to be thinking about with left hand technique? So uh, one of the main things I learned um, from Janos and from Petrarchi, um, and what I find really important, is basically making sure that you're never playing individual notes. So um, within a phrase, you're never shifting to an individual note or playing note for note, but instead you're, you've got some sort of a map of the fingerboard in your head at all times, and you're moving to hand shapes rather than, so like if you're shifting from a C to a B flat, uh -huh. you're not just shifting with individual fingers, but you're shifting thumb on the G, first finger, second finger. Yeah. And that's a Petrarchi hand shape. So you're thinking uh -huh. semi, semi, is that semi-chromatic? Semi-chromatic, yeah, yeah. So you're very clearly thinking I'm moving to, rather than just I'm moving to the B flat, exactly. which I'm reaching for. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit about, you mentioned in the, in the course <coughs> that we filmed about stretching and, and, and sort of reaching with this uncertainty. Is it a similar? Yeah, so that's also something that I learned during my time learning from Petrarchi. Even though it was short, um, we talked a lot about left-hand technique. And um, we talked a lot about um, making sure that you're not just kind of stretching down the fingerboard. Um, and something that I teach my students is to make sure that when you're moving from first position or anywhere around the neck block to thumb position, that you're bringing your arm around so that the weight is always transferring naturally through the fingerboard. Yeah. Um, that way you're not relying on the physical strength of each individual finger, but instead you're allowing your weight to really naturally hang on the fingerboard. Yeah. And in Germany, the, apart from obviously the German poet, one of the other things that we think about in terms of orchestral playing is the superb uh, instruments and five-string basses. And so was that the first time that you were introduced to the five string? And uh, what was your experience like of playing on a five? Um, yes, yeah, so obviously at first I was kind of, um, it was a little bit confronting. Yeah. Because you, ha you actually have to play on a five string in German orchestras. In most German orchestras, it's a prerequisite. So I was given a five string, a lend to five string, um, before I, I played with the orchestra. Um, my teacher at the time lent me his. And I had a chance to really, you know, get a feel for it. But um, it, it takes a bit of getting used to. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, I loved it. And, and ever since then, I've just really always enjoyed playing a five string whenever I have the opportunity to. Do you play a five string back home or are you uh, in the, at the Queensland Symphony Orchestra? So my section, in my section, everyone plays on a five string, unfortunately, except for me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's only because I have this incredible um, lion head instrument on loan to me. Um, and currently it's a four string, but if the orchestra ends up buying it or if I end up buying it, I would have a plan to add a fifth string back onto it. And that belongs to your, uh, oh sorry, to the old, the ex-principal, is Yeah, that so that belongs to my predecessor, John oh, Farden. Um, and it's, uh, the instrument's actually been in the orchestra for, I think, three, four, four generations, right from when, it, oh. right from when the orchestra began. It was a wonderful uh, TV uh, report about the double bass and about your role in the symphony, which I'll, I'll share a link to below this video. But, I mean, it, it's an incredible journey and I think it's so... Um, so brave of you at that age to go into that setting and uh, <laughs> I just wonder if you have any advice for other students who are coming up uh, you know on the orchestral scene now just to fin finish off the conversation with any thoughts that you think might help them on their journey 
Yeah, so I think advice if you're planning to go to Germany, it really helps to learn the language. I know that's not really base related, but that, that's something that is more important than you'd think. Um, but also go over there and have a look at the different teachers, really have a feel for the style of playing to decide if it's for you. Um, and I suggest, yeah, having lessons with several teachers so that you really have an idea about who it is you want to study with. Um, I think a lot of people think about the famous schools and, and go for a school when rather, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit more important to make sure that you have a teacher that you really want to learn from. Yeah. Well, I think it's great. And I, and I think hunting them out and, you know, in the way that you have is just so uh, important. And lastly, I just want to reiterate like how grateful we are that you joined us this week. It's been a real pleasure meeting you, hearing you play, hearing you teach. I think that you have a really compelling way of presenting the lessons and a really compelling uh, way of playing. And if it's okay with you, Phoebe, we're going to uh, cut to a performance that we filmed earlier uh, of you playing uh, with piano as well, actually. But just before we wrap things up, where can people find you online um, other than the Discover Double Bass lessons that we've been filming? Uh, do you have a website? Um, so firstly, I want to say thank you so much for having me here. It's been such a pleasure to present with D Discover Double Bass. Um, in terms of website, I'm working on that. I've been working on that for years. <laughs> Nothing's <laughs> happened yet. Um, but I'm very um, active on Instagram. So right. I usually post pretty much everything I'm doing on Phoebe Russell underscore bass Instagram account. Um, and also I've got a Facebook page and um, a, a lot of content online. Um, just don't have the actual official website because I just haven't, yeah. I haven't got around to it, you know. I don't know if it's important as, as it used to be, but I'll um, certainly be providing links to everything that we've spoken about today. And if you're watching at home, you want to learn from Phoebe, please check out uh, the lessons and the courses that we've filmed over at Discover Double Bass. And on behalf of everybody here and everyone watching at home, thanks for joining us. It's been a real pleasure meeting. Thanks, Jeff.